Happy Tuesday. Um, this is Daphne Atkinson from GED Testing Service, and I would like to welcome you to From the Headlines, Big Ideas in Science, um, a workshop that we're putting on today for Tuesdays for Teachers. I'm also joined on the, on the line by Debbie Fawcett, my colleague from GED Testing Service, and Susan Pittman, um, a consultant to GED Testing Service. Uh, Bonnie Goonan, I must, must say, is getting a well-deserved vacation. Uh, although we all are in vacation envy mode, she won't be with us uh, today, but she will be with us in spirit. Um, I'd like to remind you uh, that the handout panel has both of today's handouts. There's a presentation handout that has all the slides two up, um, and there is a uh, there is also a resource guide um, that accompanies it. So please uh, take the time to uh, download those materials. I'm also going to suggest that you feel free to type in any questions that might arise um, during the presentation in the question box. And we will handle them one of two ways. Um, if it's something that we think we need to stop the presentation and answer as we go, we'll do that. Um, or we'll hold those questions and we'll try to answer them at the end. So let's get started without too much ado. Um, let's first talk about the session objectives. Um, one of the things that uh, most of you who have gone to any of the trainings that we've done, uh, we've talked about the need for real life examples. So it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone on the line that one of the objectives of today's webinar is to discuss science headlines in the news. There's no better way to anchor people's learning than something that touches their lives today. Um, the second is a connected um, objective, to uh, take real world science and to connect that science to the GED science uh, theme. And third, we wanna identify some strategies and activities um, to help you help your students build scientific inquiry skills. And last, but certainly not least, as we always do, we'll take some time to share some resources. And one thing, Daphne, if you don't mind, that I'll just jump in here. Um, we do have someone who has said, where can we find the materials? And um, as Daphne pointed out, there is a, a box and it, that says handouts, and it has a little tube beside it. If you'll just open that by clicking on the arrow, you'll see the two handouts right underneath there. All you have to do is click on them, and then they will download to your computer. Um, so that what should make it uh, very accessible for you. And so we do have a couple people who are, um, I think, experiencing some issues with uh, technology issues, and we have someone with us, Tico, who will be helping with some of those issues as we're going through. So that being said, Daphne, what has science done for you lately? Well, Susan, probably a whole bunch of things. Um, first, because I have a, a bunch of seasonal allergies, those pills that I bought from the CVS, the antihistamines, science mm -hmm. has really helped me out with that. How about you? Well, you know, science actually allowed me to get out of bed this morning. <laughs> Which, you know, if you stop and you think about it, just that very act of being able to move those muscles and your breathing that's going on, all of those things, that's all science. But, you know, I want to hear from some people who are out there. So those of you who are online, what I'd like for you to do is just very quickly in the um, question box, if you would, how about typing in some things that science has done for you? Right. 
And don't forget that, you know, don't forget that spans a full continuum, not just the human body and the, you know, bodily functions that we often take for granted, but how did you get to work today? Um, how's the environment being maintained in your office? So don't forget about those things as well as you um, type in some things that science has done for you. Well, and we have some things coming in, Daphne. We have some, in fact, science told Andrew how warm I should dress today. And with Amy, it's science allowed her to see by wearing contacts. And, of course, Rachel, yes, get that plug-in. Science is allowing me to view this webinar. So just right there, we're seeing several different areas. We're looking at weather, which looks back into earth and space science. Um, we see back to life science with the contacts itself. And then we've got all that technology, which includes everything that, you know, uh, maybe work and, and forces and motion and all of those other things. Uh, Kimberly King says, hey, it helped me drive here. So there's so many different things. And Daphne, I think the thing that for many of our students, it comes down to the fact that they see science kind of cut and dried. It's, you got life science, you got physical science, and then you got this earth and space science. And then there's all these whatever questions. Whatever that means. That in, yeah, whatever that means. And then that there's means. these questions that appear on a test. And But I'm not looking at science as in the whole world around me. And so I think really a part of what we wanted to try to do with this particular um, webinar is to say, okay, let's explore beyond the book, beyond the things that, um, that we may see in a test question, but to really get students to see, hey, this is something different. You know, this is something that impacts me on an ongoing basis. And I think that a big part of what we want our students to see is we really want them to get that scientific curiosity going. You know, how sometimes you think about something and you go, well, I wonder how that works. Or right. what causes something and how is it that, well, that third bullet there, how do our brains store memories or how do our brains sometimes get overloaded and we can't remember certain things. But part of what we want to do within all this is to get students engaged and have them start to think. And with that curiosity comes that need to learn even more. So Daphne, how does that really tie into it's in the headlines? Well, um, the, we have some of the most high-utility learners in our um, GED pipeline. Um, if we can make it real to them, um, just as you um, beautifully summarized, if we can make it real for them, they can learn it. Um, and so one of the things that we talk a lot about is real-life examples. Um, as Susan said, going beyond the book. Um, going beyond memorizing a bunch of things that you're going to promptly forget. And, you know, one of the things that one of the great resources for, um, for instructors who are teaching science is that the headlines uh, form a, an amazing repository of the big ideas in science. And just think about it. I mean, when news is reported, it usually does function around the big ideas. So none of those things, none of these headlines um, should be a surprise as having a scientific underpinning. And it's a great way to get students, as um, Susan just said, to pique their curiosity. I mean, why should gas prices spike? nationwide, not just in Texas or not just in the Southwest, but nationwide after a hurricane that had, you know, for the people not in Texas, had a local effect. Um, you know, what does climate change, no matter how, which side of the climate change debate you're on, why, how is it that scientists are seeing 
um, of climate change as an embedded cause for California's wildfires. Um, I know that one of our participants is from California and wrote that um, greetings from smoky California. Um, you know, in Puerto Rico, where um, they had the one-two punch of a couple of really disastrous hurricanes, um, what happens after you have a catastrophic event like that um, in the life science arena as far as infectious diseases are concerned? Um, so, you know, to the, um, to the point, it's all um, a wrapped around our sciences you know, integrated and wrapped around almost everything that we do. And that's why we're taking this approach today. Well, so and, please. you know, what I, what I would say to everyone who's out there is don't forget these headlines here because you may see some things similar to them as we kind of move forward and get your brain thinking about how you could approach using something like this in order to move forward and help students get a better grasp of, of uh, science itself. But, you know, the students are going to come back and say, but what does this have to do with the science test? Well, if we think about the science test, we know that the content topics, they describe those key concepts that really are taught in high school courses. But in looking at the GED science test content, we've also got to see some things that are relevant to the lives of students, things that are generally familiar to them. And so if we pull back from that and we keep in mind the, you know, life science, physical science, earth and space, then let's draw in to the things that are going to have the most relevance and know that that content is pulled from areas of interest. That we can see any day coming from the headlines itself. So what we want to do as we're moving forward into this is we want to talk a little bit about taking those headlines and how we can create an inquiry-based lesson. So how are you going to begin? And this is something that, you know, we're all trying to think, okay, I have a limited amount of time. How am I going to kind of set this in motion? Well, first, we've got to know about those focusing things, and hopefully most of you here today, you do know what those are, but we'll, we'll kind of review those in just a minute. And then you think of those and you say, okay, where could I find a headline? Or maybe I've just seen something recently and I think, you know what, that may work. And then it comes into how I'm going to engage those students through that process. Now. The thing that takes a little longer in this is about really identifying resources and creating your lesson. But you know, there's so much that is out there. There are so many things that are available. And we're going to kind of show you and point you in the right direction of where you can find a lot of different resources that are there. So Daphne, how about do a quick review for us on what's a focusing theme? Okay, so the focusing things um, actually pro um, provide a framework so that, as Susan just said, you're not trying to teach everything and you're not confusing students by having them think they have to know everything. Um, so we have two focusing things, health, uh, human health and living systems and energy and related systems. And those, uh, the slide that you see on your screen arrays them against the science content topics, which are life science, physical science, and earth and space science. And, and one of the great things about these focusing themes, that if you, if you zero in on them, um, you actually end up teaching an integrated science module. Because almost every aspect, um, every single content topic can be covered um, by the health and human, uh, the human health and living systems and the energy and related systems. And one of the great things about that is it gives students a much more integrated um, look at science and it can also jumpstart their engagement. And that's what's really, um, that, that really is at the core of what we hope to accomplish with you today. Um, the, this, particular, this particular chart 
Um, for those who may be a little bit less familiar with our resources can be found um, in the assessment guide for educators in the science section or in the standalone science assessment guide for educators um, chapter. Um, so that is easily accessible um, and will hopefully um, give you some additional ideas on how that's integrated um, into the test. So, so okay. Um, how so, do we go about teaching through inquiry? How do we go about starting this whole process of scientific inquiry? And what's the model? What's the best? What is what's one of the better models for doing that? Well, the better what we found over time is we've been researching and looking at a lot of um, the basic models that are out there. It comes down to this thing called the five E's, <clears throat> and as you go through this, and, and you know, I look at this and I think, wow, this is not only for science, but I can use this in other areas too because it's all the things we want students to do. We engage, we explore, we explain, extend, and then of course we always have to evaluate. So let's take a look at what that means. What we want our learners to do is we want to engage them in, dis in discourse, discussion, through use of scientifically oriented questions. We want to bring them in and get them engaged from the beginning by having an activity that um, piques their interest and gets them talking and discussing the things that are going on. We want to go through and we want to use evidence while we explore and then responding to those questions. And what we're doing within that as we explore, we're really looking at that concept. And it may be that we do it as hands-on activities, a simple experiment might do, or maybe it's a series of questions. But we also want our learners, as a part of this process, to have the explanations that they're able to formulate those things. Now, that's going to mean that we're going to need as teachers to provide some of that explanation and how that concept really applies in real world situations. Keep in mind, we really want to tie back in to real life. What is going on and how does that impact me? From there, we as teachers are going to do the extend or elaborate, which means that we're going to see how this shifts across different contexts. You know, we're not trying to go in and find these micro pieces of information. We want to look at things in a broad, more broad context so that students can connect the explanations to science knowledge and then to real world events. If we don't have that connection, our students are going to have more difficulty as they're trying to apply what they're learning. And of course, we really do have to evaluate, and we can do that in a number of different ways, but where we can have students communicate and they can explain, you know, having that interaction makes a big difference as we're going through. So we're trying to build this scientific inquiry for students. So we go back to the headlines. It's a bird, it's a plane, nope, it's a superbug. All right. That should get your attention just a little bit. A superbug. That's been one of those words that we've been hearing a lot of more recently. In the past couple of years, um, we've seen more and more of that. But if I want to take on that topic, how could I set the stage for engaging students in the process? Well, I have some questions. And maybe I start with asking students those questions like, you ever taken an antibiotic? I think Daphne would be hard pressed to find someone who would say, <laughs> no. No. <laughs> uh, we're probably more likely to have heard about a lot of people taking a lot of antibiotics. And yeah. but then we start we delve a little bit deeper and when should those things be used? You know, I mean, I know people who will take an antibiotic for anything. And I think if we look at that, we can look at the discussion with students. And then 
Alexander Fleming, well, what's this guy got to do with any of this? Eh, hold on, we'll find out later. And then we can look at things about, again, asking questions. What have you heard about superbugs? I've heard, you know, that this is a very serious issue that we're facing as we're out there. So having set the stage, now you can engage your students. And one of the things that we like to do, and there's so many things that are out there, is engage with a video. Now, I realize if you're in a correctional facility and you're doing um, training, uh, training, teaching, then what you're going to want to do is see if uh, possibly, you know, there's different ones you can download and have them on a flash drive, and some facilities will allow you to use those inside. Other times you may have to look at this and say, uh, I can't do a video, but maybe I could do a short article, something along mm -hmm. those lines. But again, it's about first engaging. The superbugs are here. The reality is that we have a lot of people who get sick from these superbugs. And take a look. Talk about engaging somebody. By 2050, it's projected that antibiotic-resistant infections will cause more deaths annually than cancer. That's something that is a serious staggering. issue. And it is staggering, Daphne. It absolutely is that we see that kind of issue that's coming into play. So if I'm a student, ooh, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for my children? What does it mean for other family members, and what can I do about it? So again, that engagement is about getting that curiosity going. So from there, we could begin to explore. And one thing that our students need to know is what's the difference? There's bacteria and there's viruses. One works with antibiotics, one doesn't. One doesn't. And, you know, but one of the things that everybody always says is, Oh, I got a cold. I'm going to have to get an antibiotic. Is that going to do you any good? No. No, nope. it's not. Not at all. So, again, this is a one another from TED Ed where you can actually go in and they have a whole discussion on bacteria and viruses so that students can explore what the differences are between those. But we can go a little bit further than that. And as a part of that exploration, remember when we started out, we talked about a lot of this is about the questions. What are the questions and how can we, how can we answer those? And so we can have students answer some of the questions. We could do it as a group discussion. Or maybe we decide we're going to do a Venn diagram. And we have a compare contrast so we can find what are the differences and what are the similarities between the two? But again, it's about exploring a little bit deeper into this process and into this whole idea of superbugs. So now as we go through, part of what I as the instructor may want to do is we say penicillin. Is it a wonder drug or not? Think about it. I mean, of all the things that have come through, what do we have to, you know, I mean, when you think about all the illnesses that have been, where people have gotten well as a result of using some form of an antibiotic, and we look back to Alexander Fleming, and we can do a short bio so that students can understand, you know, these things don't just appear. There are actually people out there, scientists, who are doing the exploration, who are finding the different treatments that are available. So both of these particular websites give you information on those. Now, we know our students especially very much are into the graphics. And this is an excellent one coming in from you're feeling sick, here's your virus, here's your bacteria. Now it can talk about what are the things that we can do as a result of it. And I think this is an interesting um, group that has put this together. It's the, anti, the Minnesota Antibiotic Resistance Collaborative. <laughs> We're trying to make sure that antibiotics are not misused. And the only way that our students learn about that is actually 
you know, and, and don't misuse antibiotics is that they learn about it and they learn when it works and when it doesn't. And so this simple chart lays out that information for them. So in all this, we're explaining and helping students gain that knowledge. But I think, Daphne, personally, that any time you're doing a lesson, an activity of some type, that I want to integrate reading and writing. I want my students to write no matter what content area. I don't care if it's math, um, social studies, science, doesn't matter to me. But I think that that being able to express that and maybe answer some of those questions. Why are superbugs a silent health emergency? And why is there a war on superbugs? But I we totally found, agree. Well, I mean, this is the thing that students are going to be called on. I say students, but when our adults move out into the real world, what happens? They go to work or they go on to college or they go on to technical training and they have to write. So this is another way for them to identify evidence. Wow, that could come in useful on that uh, extended response in RLA, but also that it allows them to really dig deeper into what they're reading. And we found two, um, well, actually an excellent resource for those of you who are out there, Science News for Students, wonderful articles, things that are happening in the news today um, that we can have for uh, our students to read and pull that information. Again, we're not trying to get them to get, you know, a specific name or a date, but get that broader understanding. So now, if you got the web, use it. There's all kinds of activities, games, puzzles, things that you can do interacting with diseases. Maybe that's not our best header here, but it is something that um, students can participate in. They could do it on their own, you know, accessing these through, you know, a tablet or, you know, even some of these are accessible through a smartphone. But where they become the disease detective or they're going through and they're trying to determine treatment for different patients. And then we need to extend. and. One of those things that as we look out there, you know, we start thinking about superbugs. And so we're thinking, okay, that's life science. But really, superbugs has to do across the board. And when we look at earth science, there are some things that are going on because of, Daphne mentioned earlier, some of the outbreaks that are happening in Puerto Rico as a result of some of the big catastrophes that we found. Um, I saw some really interesting information the other day about the concerns they have after the fires in Northern California and the impact on human health as a result of that. So we need to understand that it's not just human health or the body itself, but let's look at how the earth interacts. And if you want to see a great video, this is from, um, it's called Windows to the Universe. It's from NBC Learn. And they do an entire thing on infectious diseases and about our changing planet. So our students could listen to the, watch the video and then see how things are spread. Where is it found? What are the symptoms and how can you prevent it? We're extending out that knowledge as we're working through. But Daphne, could we put a little chemistry into this too? Oh, of course. Um, it, w I mean, one thing that um, is uh, the the one of the differences that we looked at between a virus, which is a bunch of uh, DNA and RNA strands um, covered by a protein coat, which is different from bacteria, which are single cells um, that invade the uh, body cells. Um, we have an opportunity to think about how the chemical reactions, both how um, antibiotics work um, against by, um, bacteria, the chemistry of um, pharmaceuticals. Um, we have the um, advantage of talking about how they work with it, how bacteria impact the body um, in terms of inflammation of certain parts of the body or body systems. 
So it's a great, uh, you know, it's a, it's absolutely not just a, a bunch of silos. It's really, like you're saying, a fully integrated, um, you know, a fully integrated picture that involves all of the science content areas. Absolutely. And you know what? We can't talk science without talking about graphics. Think about all of the information that is given to us today, all of us, through some type of graphics and how our students need to be able to go in and be able to interpret the information is there. So much, rather than long articles that many people are not going to read, information is pulled down to its finest units and then provided in that way. So we have to go through and see if we can't increase the amount of work that we're doing with students on graphics. Um, and then, you know, don't ever forget the games. Um, there's the longitudeprize.org has one on superbugs and how long can you hold out against the superbugs. Um, again, keeping the student engaged but also allowing them to explore things a little bit deeper. And we need to always evaluate when students have completed a lesson. And what we would expect students to be able to take away from here is some of the basic information about what are those differences. Are all bacteria harmful? How do we deal with that overuse of antibiotics? What about that time you get a cold? What are you going to do to get better other than just have some chicken soup and wait? And what can you do in your life to reduce antibiotic resistance? That's one way of evaluating, but we could also have students do a little research and they could find different solutions to antibiotic resistance. This gets students engaged in finding information that they can use. It's about a process that allows them later on to go back and use something that will be helpful to them maybe in another topic, but they're learning the process and also learning how to find those reputable sources based on scientific facts, not just a website that looks good. So those are the kinds of things that we want our students to be able to do as they're going through. So, And that's so important, particularly the reputable um, source, because um, just think about this. Um, you, we are also asking them to sharpen um, their focus on finding evidence um, and in learning which sources are reputable. Um, it will make them more discriminating consumers of information, um, which is one of the chief challenges in adult life. Absolutely, because think about it from terms of there's so much information coming from so many different directions. And what do you believe and how do you work with it? Um, so for those of you who, um, and I know I see um, one here about uh, going through and trying out these ideas for the superbugs. Um, keep in mind that uh, we provided a, a short little workbook for you, um, but that gives an overview of those five E's so that it's not something that you have to memorize or have to just go back into the PowerPoint. But you can take a look at it from that standpoint as well um, in helping you to, to work through all of that. So, Let's take a look, because I think Daphne and I have talked enough now, um, and let's see if we can't engage you just a little bit. So what we're going to do, I want you to think as you're sitting there, what would be your first step? How would you engage your students if you were to see that headline? And just jot down some notes into the question box. How would you engage your students? What would you do to get the lesson started? I know we can't hear those 
keyboarding going on in the background. Okay, uh, from Crystal, we have, I would start with agree or disagree. And then Ariel says, well, why not ask the question, what's climate change? And then from Dr. John Rosa, we have, how hot do you think California can get? Again, we have these, look at all these ideas that are coming through. What do you know about global warming? Um, has anyone been in a wildfire? Penny, I love that. That, you know, have you been, um, have you been involved in that? Have you seen that up close and personal? And then I have from Andrew, it can also go into a study of ecosystems. There are so many different ideas that are coming through. Daphne, this is amazing looking at all the responses coming in on the I question know. box. I know. I'm looking at Janet's um, question, which I think is a great discussion starter. What do you think would be the connection um, between the climate change and wildfires? I mean, just to, you know, stimulate um, a real discussion and, again, getting into not only scientific inquiry but cause and effect, um, which is another important big idea across the content area. Absolutely. And then, you know, we have so many different things that are coming in. You know, ask students, have the picture that's in front of you. What happened here? What is this? What do they see? What destruction has occurred? Um, so you can look at so many different things about getting the discussion started. But think in terms, too, of where all this can go. We can start talking about winds. We could look at data on record high temperatures in different areas itself. We could look at the way the land is. And does that lend rainfall. itself? The geography rainfall. itself. The, the rainfall or the lack of it. Or maybe there's been too much of it. Um, last year here in North Carolina, we had a lot of wildfires. And they were the result of the year before having too much rain, so we had a lot of undergrowth, which of course then fueled some of the fires coming through. You know, you look in California where you've seen drought in different places, how does that impact? But there's so many different things, just starting with a headline, and in this case, a photo. All right, let's do another one. Get your thinking caps on out there. Yep. How would you engage your students? Okay, Andrew pops in with, what are some treatment options? Um, Amy, what kind of diseases crop up after a disaster like this? Um, why would a man drinking from water be an indicator of disease outbreak? Rachel, that's great in looking at, you know, something as innocuous as somebody drinking water. How is this happening? Um, then with Kathleen, I might try showing the photo first without the headline. That's a great way to do it. And then to ask mm -hmm. students to create that he headline. Is water safe? What happens if you have a lack of clean, safe water? Oh, Ginger, what a great question. What makes one desperate enough to drink? What could be contaminated? Those are all such wonderful questions that you're coming in with. And, you know, this is the type of thing that um, our students can do the same thing. They can start a series of questions. What are your questions about this? How would you make contaminated water safe? Now we start talking about a little chemistry. What would you have to do to treat water and, you know, decontaminate that water? And I, need, I see from Lori, is it even possible? Um, could there be old diseases that come back from bad water? Those are all different types of things that we can do. Mm -hmm. And again, straight from the headlines, we have a lesson that we can then expand out um, and work with these different areas. 
And Susan, the other thing too is that um, on occasion, um, you know, in the Northeast, if we have um, torrential rains and sometimes our sewage treatment plants fail, um, and there's an edict from the state to boil water, um, you know, for the next several days. I mean, mm -hmm. so we can also we can also um, bring that connection closer to student experience. Absolutely. And, you know, because you bring up such a good point, Daphne, because people will look at this and say, well, this is Puerto Rico. That's a long way away. It's an island. And so what happens there couldn't necessarily happen somewhere else. And so right. those are the things where we want to make those connections about how it may not have the contamination of water may not happen this way, but it might be something different. But Again, the possibility of diseases are um, present. Lori, what a great okay. idea. What are the similarities between Puerto Rico hurricanes and California wildfires? Ooh, I that's mean, a great so, discussion. It really is, especially when you start talking about winds and the directions and how things build over time and the destruction that was caused. You got guys. You got great ideas coming through on this one. Okay, thinking caps back on again. Panic draws long lines at gas stations. Okay, how are you going to engage your students? Oh, Deborah McGuire, this is from her, uh, from the last one, writing exercise, no man is an island. What a great way to approach all of this. And then we have, um, what effects will we experience by long lines at gas stations? What would you do if you were in this situation? Why are Americans so reliant on gasoline? Erin, great one that discuss renewable versus finite energy resources. Oh, Catherine, I'm not real sure if any of us really want to know what we can do if we had to live without gas. We need to be thinking about it and how that would impact. Um, Mauricio, how social media can impact real events. Um, what are some solutions to prevent panic? And then we have from Vicki, have you ever run out of gas? What effects our gas production has? Um, what's the impact, let's see, would this change affect your mode of transportation? So many different things. But again, remember what we're trying to do here. It's about engaging, getting students started into the process itself. And let's try one more. Oh, Mike has one. Um, should we open up more pipelines in America? And then Lori comes back with, would this be different if more people drove solar and battery operated vehicles? Wow, Ooh. so many different things that we could do. But we have one more here that we want to take a look at. How would you engage students? Aaron says that he would connect the gas consumption and global warming and would you want a wind farm near your home? Ah, how do wind farms work? Quite honestly, that's a, such a good one. That's such a good question because people look and they go, but there's no wires running from anywhere. <laughs> so how do we get this alternative energy? And what is wind power? And what are some of the, Joanne, good point. What are the pros and cons of those wind towers? Oh, perfect.
and we're looking at how it's energy stored. Um, do wind farms affect bird migration patterns? So many different things. What other effects are on the surrounding environment? And how much energy can they actually produce? Now we have Lee has tied it over to why would Amazon, such a large company, be interested in doing something like this? What would it mean to them? And Penny, I live in a city. Would they work for me? Those are the types of things that we can do to get students involved. From there, you would need to pull back out and look at where can I take this in terms of what's the big idea that I want to work with with students. And as Daphne was talking about earlier in the focusing theme, we have that entire thing focused on energy. And so we have everything from conservation to transformation of energy itself, so many different areas that we could be looking at. So one last thing we want you to think of, and rather than having you write it down on this particular one, but we'll just kind of toss it out there to you, that you need to be thinking about what are some other topics. You know, one of the things as Daphne and I were working on the presentation is, you know, we were talking about where do we want to go with this? What, what types of ideas are we interested in? And from there, we'll come back to, okay, where's the headlines that come into those? So think about it. How could you and what other topics might you want to really go for in your classroom? There's a number of things that are available out there. And in fact, um, an interesting one, and Daphne, if you would talk to us a little bit about Yellowstone. Yes, I, I would love to. Um, I am the classic geeky girl. Um, who loves to um, know things about um, lots of things. And one of the things that um, was a news item um, a couple of weeks ago was the super volcano under Yellowstone National Park. Um, you know, just to set the stage um, for you guys, um, I want to uh, give you a few statistics. Yellowstone on average, um, at its peak month in the year, has about 900,000 visitors. Um, and the peak season for Yellowstone is really, not surprisingly, and no one on this call will be surprised, it is June, July, August, and September. Um, the most important thing to know is that Yellowstone is actually um, one of the most seismically um, active places um, in North America. Um, and it's one of the largest active volcanoes in the world. And it's hard for us to think about that because you don't see lava flowing down the sides um, like you do in some of the Hawaiian volcanoes, but, but it is. Um, it is um, a, a what they call a caldera volcano. It is 30 miles long and 45 miles wide. That's huge. Um, and so there's a clip from CBS News, um, and the clip came about because Arizona State University released some research. Um, in the last decade, the big thing has been to put down all these sensors so that they could understand more about the geological makeup of Yellowstone. Um, and so, one of the places that you might want to start is showing this clip um, from CBS News. There's the URL for it. Um, and ask um, for any real life experiences. Um, if you think about it, there are tons of active volcanoes um, in the world. And if um, any of your students come from Central or South America or South Asia, um, you know, a little known fact that happened when I was researching this is Indonesia, for example, has 147 active volcanoes. Um, you know, if you want to, uh, just to get people started on this. 
Um, but, but this is a great um, example of a headline um, that has that that could conceivably have um, planetary um, implications. Okay, so you'd engage by giving people um, some info. Next, we would move on to Susan exploring. Um, and as Susan said earlier, we're both really huge on um, writing um, about everything. Um, and so, of course, when a research um, university like ASU puts out um, research findings, of course, there are people who are have taken a opposing position. Um, and so, um, I've given you the URLs. The National Geographic um, is the one um, that reports the ASU research. The Idaho Statesman, which is the newspaper, reports um, a, a, a volcanologist um, opposing position. He's on staff at Boise State. Um, it would give you a great opportunity to have students compare the two sides um, and construct an argument for or against whether an eruption may be imminent at Yellowstone. Um, so that's, you know, just one example, again, of, of um, you know, taking those skills um, and um, hammering, the, hammering in on them. Um, you know, then you can get students to um, identify and summarize the main major ideas in the narrative. So out of the ASU research, what are the main ideas? It's a great opportunity to extend um, students' scientific vocabulary, um, understanding terms like tectonic plates, which, you know, pretty much what the world is, is um, a bunch of uh, plates floating on a sea of magma. Um, what a caldera volcano is. Um, what is seismic activity and why does it matter? Um, and what? on Earth, I may have heard of or those of us who grew up in the Cold War era, era knew about nuclear winter, but did you know that there was such a thing as volcanic winter? Um, and then have students um, identify the cause and effect of volcanic eruptions. And that means that they understand, you know, the basics of what I, of what I just said. Um, okay, on the elaborating, extending, um, you know, if you um, think about Yellowstone, the estimated ejection of ash is, is 250,000 times that of the Mount St. Helens eruption. Um, so, you know, we've got a lot at stake if this volcano does decide to erupt. Um, there is a solution being proposed by NASA to actually cool the volcano down by pumping in water and generating thermal energy um, from that. Um, so there's, you know, so you could have students, again, like we were talking about the wind energy, um, to think about the pros and cons of the NASA solution. Um, so another opportunity to array pros and cons. And Susan, I think I oh, and and um, there are two websites that I happened to find when I was um, researching this. One is called um, EarthquakeTrack.com. Uh, um, you know, you can plot um, the timeline for the five most active volcanoes in the world on a graph. And what I love about this is. You know, it's the intersection of a lot of the skills that we want students to develop. Um, plot some timelines for the most active volcanoes in the Western Hemisphere, um, of which there are a number. And then we can ask them to actually talk about the patterns they see and quite possibly even present them with a hypothesis and ask them how would they use this data um, to um, to prove that or disprove it. Um, so there's a great um, opportunity. This is, you know, a current ongoing headline. Pick a volcano. Um, you know, pick a, um, a set of um, earthquake um, uh, swarms. Um, you know, this is earth and space science at its best. That's absolutely right, Daphne. And, you know, we had one question that came up with, um, from Cynthia says, you know, my students are really focused on that 
this E as in evaluate? And how is this related to the test? What do test questions look like on this topic? And so I think, you know, as we're taking a look at this, um, a part of what we have to realize is that there is a, a wealth of topics that can be covered on the GD test itself. And since we don't have any access to uh, those actual operational tests, what we can do is we can teach students how to take information and analyze that information and draw evidence from it. And learning the process then will enable them to be able to read the text that they encounter on the test. And we're right. trying to give skills, not just, and, and we're doing it through content. some content, content, but we right. really want students to have those skills. And so right. then whatever the, you know, whether they get a question on tectonic plates, I love saying that, um, if they get a question word? on that, <laughs> or if they're getting a question that deals with antibiotic resistance, it really doesn't matter. They know how to approach the text that they're reading or the graphic that they're um, evaluating and that they're interpreting. And so what we're trying to do is build those other skills. Um, keep in mind that, you know, students don't need to bring in a lot of rote memory into this test. Um, they're not going to be asked, what is Newton's third law of motion? Rather, they're going to see an application of that and be given the information on the third law of motion, and then they would need to identify something, okay, this is an example. And by being able to read and interpret um, different types of information from different areas really does expand their um, ability for this test itself. So, okay. Daphne, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think that is a concern yep. that... Yeah, I, I, I mean, what you said really captures the essence of it. You know, the I know it's um, I know it seems a little bit counterintuitive to think of the content taking a backseat to the thinking skills, but that's actually what Susan just described. If we can have students um, learn to think about information that they're presented in the right way. Um, and apply that thinking to whatever is in front of them. Um, and, and that happens naturally as a result of practice in, in thinking about topics. It's why we recommend that you have students write about a variety of topics um, that, you know, even though constructive response, for example, um, sits in the RLA test, um, you know, and the inclination would be to maybe deal with, um, you know, just nonfiction, uh, nonfictional informational text. Um, that nonfiction informational text could span a full gamut to include health, science, you know, um, energy, a whole range of things. And what we want students to do is to have that flexibility in how they think about things. Um, that that they it is so well ingrained um, because you give them practice doing that in the classroom. It doesn't, like Susan said, it doesn't matter what they're presented with. They're going to go to the process and go to the thinking skills, and that's going to help them get the right um, answer. So hopefully that answers some of your questions that are out there. Just remember, we're all coming back to those five E's. Engage, explore, explain, extend, and evaluate. And as the instructor and someone who's like, okay, well, I can find the headlines, but where am I going to find some other resources to go with that? What we've done is we've included a number of different resources within the PowerPoint, and we're just going to briefly go through these, but we've also included others that are in the workbook. The National Science Teachers Association has this thing called Freebies for Science Teachers. Fantastic yeah, resources. I mean, free, it's great. <laughs> because we know that in so many different programs, 
they don't have a lot of, of funds that are there. So that's a wonderful thing to go. And our students, they love things like Mythbusters or how things work. Um, that's something that um, can truly engage them in so many ways. One of my favorites is study jams. And study jams includes a lot of information on different areas within science. But for those of you who also are teaching math, it also has some areas in mathematics as well. Now another one, how science works. Um, and this comes out of iTunes, it's iTunes course. Um, it's from the California Academy of Sciences. Um, wonderful resources. And think about your students who maybe have never had an opportunity to look through the lens of a microscope. And there is a virtual microscope that you can access. Um, and students can marvel at what those things look like um, as they're going through and, and saying, wow, I didn't know I could, you know, this is what it looks like when you see these different things. So there's a number of different resources that are out there and available for you. Please don't forget from resources for the classroom that you find on the GED Testing Service website. But one thing, Daphne, I want to do very quickly is I'm going to jump over from here to um, the Word document. This is um, the handout that you have and I need to move this so that I can share this with you a little bit easier. There you go. This is from the headlines, and um, this is re resources and strategies for the classroom. And just a couple of things I want to point out to you. Um, this comes back to this circle of inquiry. Wow, looks an awful lot like those five E's as we go through. But also, we've given you an overview of the five E's just as a reminder so that when you go back, you go, okay, what is it I'm supposed to do and elaborate? Right. And then we have the science focusing themes. If you haven't accessed that through um, one of the yes, assessment guys. guides. And then this is a particular one where how this was built out, that lesson plan on superbugs. How we take a theme, infectious diseases and superbugs specifically, and then carried it across each of those domains of science so that you could mm -hmm. see then how these different pieces work. Our idea always being that we want to try, because we have so little time to get in for science, that what we really want to do is we want to make sure that we can take an area and take a specific uh, theme itself and move it across all those different content areas. Now, for those of you who, and, and I did see a couple questions, this is the actual lesson plan for Superbugs, and it gives you the different URLs and the different things to do within each of these. And, you know, we'll say thanks to Bonnie before she went on her vacation for putting together um, the lesson plan for Superbugs. And we have for you a lesson planner and also the different resources, um, at which much more than what we had on the slides itself, but um, a number of other things that you will find really useful um, as you're going through. And notice that we have the science news for students. I wanted to point this out because those are written at a 6.0 to a 9.0 grade level equivalent, and they run between 350 to 800 words. Okay. The other thing, for those of you who use Newsella or News ELA, there's an entire section on science. Um, that has wonderful articles. Because sometimes we just we need that access um, to information that will work for our students at their level. And just one other comment that I'll make before we open it up for questions across the board. But these content areas, when you're working with science, um, there is no reason why you can't do this as an entire group. 
it doesn't have to be just the GED quote GED ready students that you're working with or the GED prep but pull in your ABE students and engage them in learning about these big ideas in science um, that can make a huge difference um, for the students as they're gaining more and more knowledge as they go through. So I will um, close this out. I didn't know I was going to have to save it, but for some reason I'm having difficulty with one of my, um, my Word documents. So having said that, Daphne, I'll turn it over to you if you want to see if there's any other questions that we have. Okay. I'm looking in the question um, box. I probably need my question box to be bigger. Oh, I do see one out there. Daphne, we got kudos from Lori. She says, you make a terrific team. <laughs> then we really appreciate Thank that. Thank you so much. And, yeah. yes, there will be a recording of this. Um, uh, Teach will yeah. post this onto the GED Testing Service website under the webinars, and it will be out there um, within the next few days. So you'll have access to that as well as the handouts will be posted at that point in time as well. Okay. Um, I don't, I was trying to see. Okay, hold on one second. Um, okay, just re, I just want to remind people that the handouts are in the handout section because um, I see a couple of questions. Um, about the handouts. It says handouts too, and you will have all of the slides and the resource guide that Susan um, just previewed. And I think one of the concerns that came up with those is that it does open up in a separate window, but once you've okay. downloaded that, you can come right back to um, to the, the webinar itself. So, um, you know, Please feel free to go ahead and open up those, but I believe that Tico will be uh, posting those along with the actual um, uh, recording itself. Um, Susan, about the Apple course, um, someone has asked, Kimberly has asked, is the Apple course free? Do you know if there's a charge uh, yes, my, under that? my understanding is that one's free. Okay. Um, hold on a second. I'm just trying to look down the list. Um, a couple of kudos from people on New Zella. Oh, such highly a wonderful recommended. site. <laughs> highly recommended. That and Annenberg, um, Annenberg's website are, um, you know, two sources um, that are a go-to for our professional development team, so we highly recommend them. And they're on the list, so don't worry about having to write down the URLs. They are listed in that list um, in the back of the resource guide. Oh, and um, could you address Donna's question regarding the short answer in science going away? Okay. Um, the, the, we are swapping out, um, you know, even though it doesn't seem like it, you know, remember that the short answer is an item type just like the other item types in science. Um, and we are giving it a vacation uh, during 2018. Um, so the um, short answer um, is not going to be on any of the test forms for 2018. Um, we are not changing the assessment guide. Um, because although they will not be on the test forms for 2018, they may make a reappearance at some point in the future. Um, so not for 28, they're starting with uh, the new test forms that will um, be introduced in late December for 2018. There will not be the science short answers. But like I said, not so, they're being swapped. The, the exam time will remain the same, and they will be replaced by other item types. I needed to say that. 
Okay, and we have a question from Catherine Ladd, and it deals with um, exposing students to more difficult terminology, like things like meiosis and mitosis and that type of thing. Um, so, Daphne, what are your thoughts in terms of some of that specific uh, vocabulary, terminology that students might need? Um, you know, I think that I, I think that there's a value in developing um, some scientific vocabulary, but I, I will also say that it's really important to keep in mind that they don't know, have to know absolutely everything about any topic in science. Um, that it's it, it, the coverage um, of the of what's on the science exam is effectively detailed in the assessment guide for educators. So it's not everything. Um, but there, you know, I think that what we hope to illustrate today is the fact that the vocabulary associated with the big ideas in science, focus on that, um, not, you know, nailing down every possible permutation in vocab, you know, in special, highly specialized um, vocabulary. Um, you know, a lot of times if you look at um, some of the questions that are part of the item sampler, um, that there, there's a lot of things that are explained in the, in, in the context of the question. Um, and so some highly specialized things probably would be described in the, you know, defined for students in the, um, in the question. So, you know, focus on the big, the vocabulary associated with the big idea, um, not down to, you know, the weeds, as it were. That's a good point. And, you know, I, just one resource that um, some of you may want to take advantage of in terms of having lots of different vocabulary is um, the Reading Teacher's Book of Lists is a great resource for vocabulary across different content areas. And you can get that through Amazon. It's just a resource, a reference for you as an instructor, but they do have a lot of different terms from science and math and social studies and all different areas. So that could always be helpful. We also have someone who brought up, um, as a Spanish GED teacher, um, some of the links that we provided, some of those resources are also available in Spanish. Um, some of them have some translations that are there. This particular PowerPoint is not. I'm sorry, um, but those are the. But there are some of the resources that we've included, and we're trying to include more of those um, along with that. Um, let's see. There was one other one. Oh. Uh, Noemi, um, page nine in the handout, yes, it is intentional, it's blank. Um, that was just our um, editing error where we did not get that page um, out. So mm -hmm. you're not missing anything there. We didn't delete that page break there. So. And they can I use it as a note-taking page. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We've meant that. <laughs> um, it, if I remember correctly, there is a um, certificate that they can print. Isn't that correct? When it gets posted onto the the um, GED yes. testing service yes. website. Okay. Yeah. And then we have a, t a question from Pierre who says, "I only teach math." Um, how can math teachers benefit out of this webinar? Oh, I, you could still take a number of those different headlines and look at how you could address different math problems from that. Um, I think about the gas shortage and the fact that <clears throat> there are a number of, of graphs and tables that are out there related to that, but also when people saw increases in prices of gas from, you know, 209 to 269, what percent increase is that? Um, if we start looking at, um, you know, uh, different things in California and we, we talk about, you know, the destruction of property, I mean, there was such a loss 
you know, between the loss of lives, but also the loss of property as well out there. We're talking some big numbers. What are those and what do they represent? So there's a number of different things that we can do. Um, and as, Connie, and uh, Susan, just to jump in, just mm -hmm. to jump in, um, the uh, another math, um, another math um, uh, concept is um, having students um, graph the um, average gas prices of the ten largest U.S. metro areas. Um, have them um, calculate a national um, a national um, average. Um, or um, the the mean or the mode um, of those things. So headlines often come um, with their own, uh, you know, headlines often come with background math um, that you can tease out and help actually um, reinforce the um, conceptual learning that needs to um, happen. And, and, and sometimes it'll take a little bit of art on your part to tease that out and to think about um, engaging students not only with, you know, just developing word problems, but also if they're presented with an array of data, um, getting them to um, understand what's the best way to display this data so that you can actually analyze it and, and draw conclusions from it. Um, so the headlines yeah. offer, I think, a great, um, a great example um, uh, great sets of examples for math teachers as well. And you know what, as you're talking, we're getting um, different math activities popping in from other people. Another math concept right. is the amount it will take to rebuild the community after the storm, the fire, etc. That's from um, Annette Anderson. And then from Aaron, average number of earthquakes in a time period, a range, median, and so on. I mean, yeah, this is the great thing, Daphne, about having all these people together. There's all these yeah. fantastic ideas that are coming Absolutely. in from everybody. And for there's, those, there's, um, just like science, but just one thing, Susan, just like mm -hmm. science being everywhere and we're, our lives are in wraps in science, math is everywhere too. Um, oh. and, and, and part of the challenge as a math teacher that you have is to bring that home to students, um, that math is everywhere and their lives, you know, when they run like clockwork, run because math helps them do that. Absolutely. And um, I did have a question from Connie. She wanted to know the name of the book again, and I posted that under the chat. It is the Reading Teacher's Book of List. And then I'm going to do very quickly one other thing. Um, because I want to be able to, we did have a question regarding where are the webinars located. And so I'm pulling up onto the site, to the GED Testing Service website, and let me get this over to here. And it's, it'll be coming up in just a second. I say that. There we go. Okay, so GED testing service, and if you go under four educators and scroll down to webinars, webinars. Okay. you will see the different information. This was the webinar we did in August about um, data analysis, and then we had three that we did in math. Um, for February, April, and June. And you can track back um, into 2015 for different webinars that are here. And you'll notice it says download the certificate of completion. Um, it has watched the webinar. It has the slides, the workbook. All of those different things will be listed there. So just give Tico a little time to get this posted because it does take a while to convert the videos and that type of thing. One other thing while I'm here, subscribe to emails. If you're not already getting in session, and I know some of you are because you were talking about having seen things in session, um, please make sure that you do that. 
um, as you're um, out there that you go ahead and sign up for end session so you'll know all the latest greatest when it happens and with that being said, do we have other questions that we need to answer at this point? I didn't see any. Oh, I will say this to Kimberly King. She said that book is terrific but quite pricey. Um, the Reading Teacher's Book of Lists, I bought a used copy, and it cost me $9. I would highly recommend that because the book itself, um, uh, you know, you have all these new editions that come out. But, you know, I primarily wanted to know the list and I wanted to also know um, the um, activities that it had in the back. And so a used copy for your own reference works perfectly. Okay, I have no idea, Melissa, why you're getting an article about Trump on AOL. So <laughs> I, I really don't know where that one is particularly coming from, but um, we'll try to <laughs> – that. no, that's not exactly where you're supposed to go. So, um, But we'll work from there. Daphne, anything else that we need to um, address? Um, I, was, I was looking – I think somebody's asking when does the science um, short answer go away. Um, the, the actual form – um, will be available. The new forms, I think, will be available at the very end of December. Um, so up until that time, um, it will still be on the 2017 um, science form. Um, but um, as soon as late December rolls around, um, the, we'll transition. And typically, um, right before the holidays, um, you know, testing um, you know, you guys go on hiatus, uh, students are celebrating the holidays, and so um, it's a, kind of an ideal time for us to introduce, um, you know, uh, this change. And so, um, you know, when students come back to test in January, um, they will definitely um, be coming, they may definitely come back and tell you, I didn't see the, you know, the short answer, and they will be correct, and you will be able to say you knew about it. Okay, well, having said that, um, oh, okay, I, I mean, yes, will okay, the practice so test else, reflect that change? Yes, they, it will, and it will be also introduced on the same timetable in late December. Um, and somebody asked, um, you know, why, um, because, you know, I, I think that, one of the things to keep in mind um, is that we have a, a, a tremendous um, amount of flexibility as a, as a result of having put the, the content area test on a computerized platform. And in the, in the old days, um, when we put um, items and forms together, um, you know, it was, every, it was in every 10 year or so, give or take, um, exercise to, you know, shift over to a new test form. Um, I think that what you will, um, what you have seen um, in the four years that we've had um, this test in the market, you know, some evolutionary things have, have happened um, close to real time. Um, and that's really the beauty of what we have now versus what we had in paper, that the test can flexibly evolve and we can try things and we can come up with better um, items to measure certain kinds of skills. Um, and I want to make sure if I didn't say emphasize this or I didn't say this before, the same kinds of skills that we measured with the um, uh, short answer um, can be and will be measured by those items that we're swapping um, them out for. Um, so it's not going to be a change in what needed to be focused on in terms of preparing students for the test. It's, as I said, it's a swap of an item type. That's how you should view it. 
So we should continue to make sure that we're focusing on hypotheses and um, dealing with experimental design and those types of things. Yep. Yep. Okay. I mean, we, they can, you know, those things can be tested in, you know, dozens of ways. Okay. Perfect. Well, just at, because we are coming in with about five minutes left in, in this time frame, and so what I'm going to do is I really want to um, say thank you to all of you who have been here today and participating in this. It has been absolutely fantastic. Seeing all those ideas flying through on the screen was just amazing, and it's, it's that, that synergy of having all of you together and focusing in on these topics and you know sometimes we think you know how am I going to come up with some idea to really get this going with students and those ideas just flowed from you today and I really appreciate um, what you did and, and all of the input that each of you provided as you were going through so that being said um, Daphne, I'll leave it to you to have the last word. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I'm going to echo what you just said. Um, fabulous group, um, fabulous ideas. Um, you know, part of our goal with this webinar is to prompt um, your thinking um, both inside the box and outside the box. And I think you certainly demonstrated um, your um, flexibility and creativity today. Um, and my wish is, and, and I know it's Susan's as well, is that you would take um, just one thing away from this webinar that you take back to the classroom and implement. Um, and best, best of all, if you could let us know what that is and how it went, it would be fabulous. Um, because we're always looking for ways to um, extend um, our reach to you. Um, and to address things that um, are of major concern to you. So with that, um, I would like to say thank you, thank you, thank you, um, and that we will um, talk to you again. We have one more webinar. I think, isn't that right, Susan? We have one more left for the year. Um, um, and I think, I think so. we have one in December. <laughs> yes, we have one in, we have one in December. Um, so we won't say goodbye for 2017. We'll, we'll save that for our December installment. But thank you again for being with us, um, spending the time with us. Um, and as always, thank you for all you do um, for your students. Have a great day. <laughs>